There it is. Uh, this week, the um, topic is sort of the, uh, the heart of Chinese and East Asian history, the Tang and Song dynasties. And I want to say a little bit about uh, East, East Asian history uh, more broadly to start with. Uh, it is the great comparison and has become ever more evidently so in recent years. It is uh, so cut off from the Afro-Eurasian uh, land mass that it is very difficult to, uh, to engross Chinese history, uh, much less Korean, Japanese, or Vietnamese history, into some narrative that emerges from the Middle East or Central Asia or the Mediterranean or Europe. In other words, uh, almost everything that I've uh, had you look looking at so far um, has a, uh, there are connections that you can make. And with the exception of the Han-Rome uh, comparison, which as I said is kind of an artificial one and not wildly convincing, uh, East Asia has been sort of off the map. But East Asia is, uh, is remarkably different, and yet it's a difference that, um, that uh, kind of compels comparison as opposed to the difference you have in the New World or in pre-Columbian America, which we'll be dealing with next week, where uh, very few people have tried to, to see great comparisons uh, with uh, the Afro-Eurasian uh, you know, ecumene uh, or East Asia because the differences appear to be incommensurable and because you don't have uh, literary sources that allow you to flesh out important points. So the question is, what do you do with East Asian history um, if, you're, if you're writing world history? The answer that we had in writing The Earth and Its Peoples was to make sure that we had a really good East Asian historian on our author team. Uh, Pamela Crosley was a, uh, teaches at Dartmouth, is a distinguished uh, professor of uh, East Asian history there. Uh, but after the third edition, she decided to separate from the group. So while her name is still on the cover, because by contract, the publisher can use our names forever, you know, long after our demise, you know, our names can still show up on the earth and its peoples. Uh, she um, went off and did other textbook projects and so on. Uh, and we were, uh, uh, we benefited from the fact that she had created a structure for us that would uh, carry on our coverage of East Asia after she left the group. There is a question of who was going to pick up East Asia. And uh, we talked extensively about finding a new author. And one thing and another, and ended up I picked up East Asia. So um, you know, my responsibilities uh, became expanded. But that also, in a sense, I think was essential <clears throat> for moving from being a Middle East historian uh, where uh, comparisons with you know, ancient Near East, with Rome, with Greece, with Central Asia, with India, with Africa are kind of natural extensions uh, to having to think more concretely about the, uh, uh, the different uh, qualities that you, guessed, that, that you get to when you uh, move into East Asia, both what the qualities are and why uh, they seem to be so different. Uh, obviously, when you come to the New World, uh, the why is easy to explain. Uh, there weren't any Europeans there. But 
uh, for East Asia, um, you have to be more, uh, a little more perspicacious. My own introduction to Chinese history came many years ago when I took a survey course with uh, two very famous professors at Harvard, John King Fairbank and Edwin Old Father Reischauer, a course called Rice Patties. It was a full year of East Asian history. Uh, Fairbank was a specialist in China, Reischauer was a specialist on Japan. Uh, and the course proved to be um, memorable. But memorable for the wrong thing, perhaps. Uh, I did decently in the course, and it was interesting, and I memorized the, roughly the dates of the Chinese dynasties, and I learned something. But it was an early lecture by John Fairbank that somehow became riveted in my memory. This was in uh, the 50s when we did not have relations with the People's Republic of China, and so he was showing slides to, uh, to tell us about uh, what China was like visually. Old uh, two-inch black and white lantern slides. And he showed a picture of a, a group of villagers uh, on the North China Plain, which is where, of course, Chinese civilization is felt to arise. Um, and you know, they were standing on the outskirts of the fringes of a conical pile of dark matter. And he said that human waste is collected as night soil and used for fertilizer. And then the next picture showed uh, several sub-cones. The big one had been divided. And the same villagers were there. And he said, when you've collected enough night soil, you can divide it into smaller piles. That, that's hip. That is the big memory <laughs> from the course. And the reason it's a memory is that I somehow had uh, an uh, epiphany at that moment. And I recognized that this is the great metaphor of history, of history writing. That uh, your, your basic material the documents, the records, the archives, the, uh, the material artifacts are um, night soil. <laughs> but when you get enough of it, you can divide it into smaller piles. <laughs> and the skill of the historian is in the division into the smaller piles. That it is the organization of the, um, of the data that uh, for one reason or another, has survived from the past, rather than the data uh, themselves that, uh, that you know, makes a construction of history um, persuasive uh, or not persuasive. And that, of course, um, uh, was an epiphany I had in the context of East Asian stuff, uh, East Asian civilization. And it kind of led to thinking about, well, is East Asia one big pile? Or is it a series of smaller piles? And if it's the latter, how do you, how do you divide them? Now, the subtitle of that course was East Asia, the Great Tradition, which basically said it's one big pile. Um, and there was a lot of historiography uh, of that period that was really uh, oriented toward that idea. That's basically, you have the history of China, and then it has some outliers. But it's the central story of China that is the history of East Asia. And that central story uh, focuses on a series of uh, dynasties. These dynasties are conceived of as having the mandate of heaven, uh, heaven being, uh, in this case, a kind of uh, analog for, uh, for the almighty in Western traditions. Uh, and uh, from, say, 650 down to um, you know, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, 
the heartland of China, that is to say, China, Manchuria, um, uh, Tibet, um, you know, China and its uh, and the, the areas that the, Ch the Chinese government claims to be uh, pure Chinese, uh, that area has rarely been ruled by more than one administrative uh, entity at a time. In other words, a single central government is the dominant story. Uh, and from about 1275, uh, that's the last time you have two governments. Uh, from then on, you really have a series of, of centralized states, uh, which supports the one big pile uh, thesis. Uh, backing this up was a very strong uh, uh, tendency at that time, back in the 50s and 60s, to pay a great deal of attention to Confucianism and to the idea that uh, there is not simply a political uh, uh, center of gravity that expresses itself in Chinese history, but even more a, uh, an ideological center of gravity focusing on Confucianism, which through by means of which you can see the extension of the Chinese uh, model to Korea, Japan, and Annam, or the old name for Vietnam, that uh, the Confucian classics came to be read in those, in those areas. Uh, there was always a certain artificiality to this. That is to say, the tendency was to, uh, to um, say relatively little about Buddhism, uh, even though Buddhism uh, became, in the post-Han centuries of, of division in China, and well into the Tang dynasty, Buddhism became uh, the popular religion of China and spread into these outlying areas, so it became uh, a primary religious outlook for Japan and Korea, uh, Vietnam, but it did not have the, uh, the unity that, uh, that existed in Confucianism, because uh, whereas you had uh, uh, certain classic Chinese works that would have been translated from Sanskrit and that were considered the Buddhist uh, scriptures, there were a variety of them and different, uh, uh, different Buddhist interpretations would call upon different texts or interpret the texts differently as opposed to the Confucian texts, which were uh, tended to have a fairly consistent interpretation uh, even when you moved out of purely Chinese uh, territory. So Buddhism was under, uh, understressed. Taoism, a more of a, uh, uh, a nature-oriented, uh, non-governmental philosophy, uh, tended to be understressed. And there was very little ever mentioned about uh, uh, local uh, religious uh, traditions in China, even though those traditions uh, are, um, ha showed enormous tenacity. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a book uh, written on uh, uh, fox demons in China. And it was fascinating. For hundreds and hundreds of years, there has been the, a belief widespread in China that foxes can appear in human form as a kind of uh, uh, demonic, something maybe akin to the jinn for the Arabs or something of that sort. And the foxes have the capacity to bring you a business success, so you want to propitiate your fox, uh, and they are foxy. They are uh, sexually enticing, so you can find yourself married to a fox without, I can't say without realizing it, because hey, you must know. Um, and you'll have shrines to the foxes where you can um, uh, you know, make offerings and so forth and propitiate them. 
but they could also um, mess you up. So you have to be afraid of the foxes. Uh, this, the, the data in this book brought the question of uh, the veneration or the belief in fox demons basically down to the present day. It's been around for a couple of thousand years, but it would never get mentioned in the sort of the high culture assumptions uh, that, ha that have been so much uh, dominant in the narration of Chinese history. And oddly enough, uh, I, after I read the book, I talked to a uh, colleague who's a specialist in Japanese history and said, oh, you know, the, uh, the imperial line of Japan descends from a fox. Uh, is that the same as the Chinese? And the answer was, do the Chinese believe in foxes? Uh, so here you have two parts of this East Asian civilization that are really into foxes. And they don't communicate on the matter because there are so many things that are below the, um, uh, the threshold of historical visibility. Now, one of the things that happens when you have a, a region like Europe in particular, where you have a, uh, an enormous fragmentation of politics, is that those things that are local uh, are likely to be talked about and have some sort of significance imputed to them, uh, whereas in areas that you, where you have a comprehensive state, uh, you're perhaps less likely to have these localisms uh, present. On the other hand, the localisms are all in the record. Now this showed up historiographically uh, in a couple of ways. One was to, uh, to try to diminish, to sort of provincialize uh, or de-emphasize the, the history of the, the mainstream Chinese population, the Han Chinese, and to talk about other peoples. Uh, the, Han, the Han Chinese are vastly uh, preponderant demographically, uh, and they are the people most associated with the dynasties of the, um, the Sung and the Ming and the Qing. Well, not the Qing, they're Manchus, but, um, but the idea that, that non-Chinese peoples have uh, had their fates and their identities folded into the history of the Han Chinese, that became a uh, historical historiographical concern. So you had historians who said, let us recover uh, the other Chinese, uh, not literally the Han Chinese, but the other people who were playing a role in East Asia. In some cases, that would be fairly obvious, like the Koreans and the Japanese or the Vietnamese. But in other cases, it's much less obvious. Uh, the role of the nomads from the Northwest, whatever they were called, uh, of the uh, Mongols and the Manchus of, you know, more directly to the north, uh, the Tibetans from the west, uh, and various peoples from the southwest, which still remains a uh, comparatively understudied uh, area, at least from the, from the perspective of trying to bring the southwest into the whole, uh, the whole sweep of Chinese history. That was what Pamela Crosley brought to, uh, to our text. She was deeply interested in the Mongols and in other non-Chinese uh, players in the, uh, in, the, in the broad story of Chinese history. Um, uh, less interested in those that had established states, the Koreans and the Japanese and the Anamese, but very interested in the Central Asian and the Northern connections uh, that you had, but also in the Southwest connections. Uh, for example, by emphasizing the, uh, um, the origin of the Black Death uh, in Southwest China, the Black Death that struck Europe in 1348. <coughs> Just recently, it's been reported that the 
study of uh, corpses from plague pits in different parts of Europe have confirmed that the Black Death was, in most parts of Europe, a single um, organism, and that that is an organism that does come from southwest China, where it is uh, endemic among rodents in the area. So, uh, so Pamela Crosley um, uh, gave us uh, three chapters that were, uh, you know, that talked about this diversity. Uh, the one for this week, and then a week after next, we will have a chapter on the Mongols and their effect. That was originally two chapters, but uh, there was some sort of pushback from people saying, why do the Mongols get two chapters? and the Chinese don't get two chapters, or the Lithuanians don't get two chapters, or the Belgians don't get two chapters. Why do the Mongols, they killed everybody. They were bloodthirsty, they were, uh, they were awful. Why do they get two chapters? So that had to be taken apart and put back together in a single chapter form, which was my task. Uh, but that was one way of, of looking at it, talk about the, um, uh, uh, the, the non-Chinese uh, peoples uh, involved in it. Um, the, um, the other way um, had more to do with the question of, uh, of comparison. Um, where you, you say, uh, is this a civilization that has um, qualities that can be compared with other world regions that are not necessarily um, derivative from some sort of political or, uh, or religious or philosophical uh, central story. Uh, and so you had a uh, the growth of an increasing emphasis upon uh, Chinese East Asian history from a material standpoint, uh, the, uh, the economy. I think probably the, the, the first really influential work here was a book by Mark Elvin called The Pattern of the Chinese Past. Came out in the 1970s. Uh, more recently, we have had um, uh, books comparing China's and uh, China and other parts of the world in material terms, uh, such as G. E. R. Lloyd's uh, *The um, Ambitions of Curiosity*, which compares uh, China in the ancient period with Greco-Roman, particularly with Greek. Um, uh, society, and more recently Kenneth Pomerantz, a book called *The Great Divergence* that deals with uh, with China in comparison with uh, Europe uh, in the uh, 18th, 19th centuries. So, uh, what happens in these efforts is that the longitudinal aspect of Chinese history. This idea that you have a long, a long series of, of single uh, government uh, uh, political structures that, um, that invites you to sort of move from dynasty to dynasty, making comparisons longitudinally as you go forward, becomes sort of taken apart and you say, well, let's, let's look at China in this moment and that moment in comparison with other places. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't preclude the idea that you have a, uh, you know, some kind of uh, big pile uh, essence to East Asian history, uh, but it, it attacks it from a different direction. If you want to get a feel for the difference that Chinese history has, uh, one place to look is in a 
justifiably ignored uh, science fiction trilogy uh, that's considered to be the pioneering work in Chinese science fiction. It's by um, by Zhang Shi Guo, and it's called the City Trilogy. It's about planets somewhere that have various peoples or, or, or you know, races on them that enter into different relations. And if you have read, as I have, uh, you know, virtually every big science fiction book of the last 50 years, uh, and you go to this, you say, wow, this is, this is different. This is really, really, really different. It's boring. <laughs> um, and it uh, doesn't uh, have much of a takeaway in the long run. But, the di but you think, this must be written by someone who's really Chinese. Because it, it, it assumes there is this great story about the city of uh, Sun Lan. And over thousands of years, the city persists. And it is sacked, it is rebuilt, it's sacked, and it's rebuilt, and on and on and on to no particular point. But underlying it, there is a, uh, a philosophy. And the philosophy is embodied in a series of uh, monosyllabic terms that all sound the same. Uh, like, you know, hu, ku, lu, mu, nu. Say, so he was an expert in hu, ku, mu, nu. And somebody else was actually more adept in who knew, kudu. And it, it's weird. And, but uh, it's very suggestive, because it, it leads you to thinking about how uh, the, the degree to which your own assumptions about abstracting uh, uh, a narrative of something are affected by your, uh, by your cultural and historical uh, heritage. Uh, I remember sitting down once and writing an outline for a science fiction novel, a uh, great inter, you know, intergalactic, interstellar uh, saga that was entirely based on the Crusades. And um, I thought it was really cool, but not worth writing. Uh, it, but it was very clear that it was going to be based on the Crusades. Uh, you take a uh, a new work, or something, uh, say, by uh, Neil Stevenson's novel, Anathem. It was a great novel of enormous length. And you realize about halfway through that it's the, the, the story of Western civilization. Um, the last several thousand years and the next several thousand years. All put together in this, um, you know, artful science fiction package. Because uh, in, in some ways the, the imagining that you have of uh, the abstraction, let us say, that leads into the imagining of a, a future or a different society uh, arises out of, your own, uh, out of your own heritage about the equipment that you have, uh, that you have grown up with. Um, so uh, I inherited this job of handling uh, East Asia. Um, from the feedback of users, uh, they said, we want more on Korea, uh, we want more on Japan, we want more on Vietnam, uh, we already have enough of the Mongols, thank you, um, but we don't need so much on China, per se. And I'm not sure that that is going to persist. I mean, one of the questions that we have. I, at the very beginning of this course, I said, would it be possible to write a world history for all the world? And it raised the question as to whether um, the circumstances of the world uh, become a very broad determinant of what is important in the world. Uh, so that as China, or if China, becomes a, a spectacularly more important part of the world, uh, will, there, will you have a, uh, a corresponding growth in the 
sense that the story of China should be told in more abundance? Uh, will the number of chapters devoted to China um, increase as the Chinese uh, GDP increases? Uh, and I don't know. Uh, it's, it, it's something of a mystery uh, as to what the feedback mechanisms are in this sort of thing. Uh, I think the, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, we have seen that there are some very clear feedback mechanisms ab uh, at work in instructing us what we should be looking at in history so that um, we're now being told in the aftermath of 9-11 that we should um, pay a great deal more interest to the convivencia, the living together quality of Jews, Christians, and Muslims in Spain in the Islamic period, even though there might not have been that much difference between Spain and Egypt. Uh, everyone points out that Maimonides was a great philosopher from Spain, but he also lived in Egypt. Um, we're told now that we should pay more attention to the Crusades, uh, for better or worse, uh, or to the conflict between the Greeks and the Persians, um, or to um, uh, issues of Islamic religion that, uh, that had virtually no interest whatsoever for anybody uh, prior to 9-11. Uh, prior to um, so what we've experienced is that uh, a world affecting event has uh, put pressures on historians to change the mix, to, uh, to do history a little bit differently. Well, we can do that. Because if you're in Western history, whether it's in the Islamic side or the Christian or the Jewish side or the Russian side or something like that, you know, you can fake it. You can, you know, you, you can tweak it this way or that way to suit an audience. The question is whether that will, uh, whether that will hold for East Asian history. You know, will we have a, <clears throat> a felt need either to glorify the Chinese past or possibly to demonize the Chinese past, um, or both. Uh, and we can't see that uh, at the moment. I mean, in a more grander context, you know, if global climate change uh, leads to the world's chief um, you know, farmland being in Canada and you know, northern Russia, then we may have to tweak things in another direction. This isn't the only possible uh, tweaking in the involved. But certainly the role of China is a is something that is um, that is in play at the moment. Uh, now there are two other things I want to, to, to point out in this uh, in, in this respect. Uh, and they're kind of um, uh, opposites of one another. One is the question of the story of contacts. There is a school of thought in world history writing that moments or incidents of contact between cultures um, should be central stories in terms of the, uh, the narrative of world history. Central stories because they are uh, small acts that anticipate the convergence of the world in an era of globalization. In other words, if, if the big theme of world history is that the globe eventually comes together, that the different peoples get to know each other, the different cultures affect one another, uh, uh, different political and economic structures um, sweep across the globe. If convergence uh, is the, the big theme, um, then do you, do you give special attention to those moments or individuals or events? 
that seem to either contribute to or signal this sort of thing. So you have a, um, an emphasis on uh, certain travelers uh, or merchants or uh, artifacts that seem to betoken some sort of contact. In other words, you can read a, a book on Roman commerce in the Indian Ocean and you'll be told that Roman coins uh, show up in India. Uh, maybe they show up in China as well. But you won't be told what the local coins are in India. You'll be told whether there are Roman coins in India. And, and you're, you, you're led to think, gee, if the Romans got there, uh, that must be something. If uh, Alexander the Great is considered the uh, the parent of the royal families of Malaysia, then that must mean something, even if it's total nonsense. Uh, and yet, uh, alternative stories about where the royal lineages of Malaysia came from uh, aren't, uh, aren't talked about, um, because it's the Western connection that seems to be the important one, because that's the link. How important are these links? Um, my inclination is to say that these links have been, uh, you know, exaggerated uh, and that they don't necessarily have a great deal of importance, although they often yield uh, very interesting stories. Um, but that the, the differences uh, are, are more intriguing. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples of differences. Um, when you study the history of money. Uh, it is, there's a standard narrative, which you've picked up bits of in previous chapters of the Earth and its peoples, a standard narrative in which uh, coinage is invented in Lydia in the sixth century BC in, um, um, in Turkey that uh, the practice of um, hammering an image <clears throat> onto a piece of gold or silver spreads from there, and that coining uh, becomes very rapidly a commonplace uh, throughout the, the so-called ancient world. Uh, and a great deal can be known about it because the coins actually survive. And you can study the coins in, in many ways. You can look at the images on the coins and uh, interpret them in various ways. You can read the inscriptions on the coins, uh, which sometimes are simply the name of a ruler, but often they will tell you other things. You can look at the denominations of the coinage, uh, which may be there. Uh, and you can look at uh, how the coinage uh, varies over uh, over time, and numismatists have developed uh, extremely sophisticated ways of analyzing coinage. Uh, you know, there is a summer seminar for graduate students in the American Numismatic Society where you can actually learn some of these techniques, uh, and you realize that this is a um, uh, a major source of of historical knowledge. For anyone who's in Islamic history, uh, there's the added advantage that every coin uh, virtually, at least after 700 or so, uh, has the date of the issue of the coin written out in Arabic uh, words, and then after about 1400 or so in, uh, in uh, numerals, uh, and it has the place of the mint uh, put on the coin. So you can actually see uh, you know, the ebb and flow of this coinage. And the coinage is in gold and silver and copper. You get extensions of it into India, extensions of it into, um, into uh, Europe, rather belatedly extensions, some extensions south of the Sahara. Um, 
but you get to East Asia and the coinage is entirely different. Entirely different. In the first place, gold and silver are not used. Uh, instead, you have copper. And it's, it's usually said that copper is the coinage of China, say, in the period of the Tang and the Sung. But, but in fact, you have other traditions in China. Uh, there are areas in Western China uh, that use iron coinage, uh, areas in Southeastern China that use lead coinage, uh, and some that use a, uh, a combination of metals. But the main area uh, region was, uh, well, used copper. Not only that, but the copper was uh, cast in molds. Now, the, the notion of making a coin uh, in the West was that you had a, um, you had something like a, uh, a, you know, a stump of wood. And then set in that, there would be a, uh, an iron die. And this die would have carved into it an image uh, on the top. Then you would take a, this is called the anvil die. Uh, then you take another die, and that's called the hammer die. And you put the blank or the flan uh, on top of the anvil die, and you lower the hammer die on top of it, and you take a hammer and you smack the hammer die uh, with the hammer. And this causes, since silver and copper and gold are comparatively soft, the image that is on the, uh, the anvil die becomes um, hammered into the uh, one side of the coin, and that that is on the hammer die gets onto the other side of the coin. And so then you have a finished coin, you move it aside, and you put another blank in there, and you hammer another coin. Hmm? The width of what? Of the coin? Of the dies? It's the same as the width of the coin. Yeah, they're, they're comparatively uh, small. That's the reason you have the anvil die is set in a much larger base. Uh, but it's how big the coin is will be uh, the determinant uh, of how substantial the, the die is. And um, this is a uh, this is known as, uh, you know, stamping a coin. It's what's done as, uh, at a mint. And it has certain technical qualities. For example, um, the orientation of the hammer die to the, an to the anvil die. You know, coin catalog, you might see an arrow that will say they're pointed in the same direction or they're pointed in opposite directions or they're pointed crosswise. Uh, because in some cases, they're hinged. And therefore, you get a constant uh, thing. It's also well established that the hammer die wears out before the anvil die, because it's getting more of the force from the hammer. And therefore, if you have a crack, it inevitably cracks appear, the crack appears first in the hammer die. And therefore, you wear out the hammer die before you wear out the anvil die. So then you put in a new hammer die, and then you say, OK, well, here's a coin that has a anvil die and a new hammer die. And you, you put hundreds of coins in a row, and you can say, oh, now we have what are known as die links. And therefore, we can give a chronological series by the replacement of dies. The very sophisticated uh, stuff. Um, but of course, you may have to hit, hit it twice with a hammer because you missed the first time. And then you get double struck coins or all sorts of weirdnesses uh, show up in this, uh, in this process. Um, but if you know what's going on, you can tell a lot. At one point uh, in my career, I got a call from the head of the, the chief uh, Islamic numismatist of the American Numismatic Society. And he said that a, a, a hoard had been found and it had got on onto the uh, coin market, had been found in Iran 
and half the hoard was in London and the other half was in New York, and it would soon be dispersed among coin collectors uh, by the merchant who uh, had the hoard, and he wanted to have the hoard recorded uh, before it got dispersed. But he didn't have the time to do it, so he asked me if I'd come to New York and record the, the hoard. And um, so I came down, and for the first time and only time, I had a stack of gold coins. You know, <laughs> they're fun to play with. You know, you can put in your nose, your, your ear, you can just sort of rub them, throw them up and down, all those things you always want to do with gold. Um, but as I, uh, as I started recording the, the hoard, it quickly became apparent that uh, all of the coins were from the same dies. Uh, and I could lay them out in order at which they were struck, because there was a crack, and the crack grew. And I could see the, uh, the crack grow over a sequence of about 70 dinars. These are gold dinars. And, um, and so then you, you think, why would you ever have 70 gold di dinars that are sequential issues from the same dies, uh, particularly when they are from a ruler who had previously been known to have only two extant coins, or two or three, a virtually unknown ruler from a numismatic point of view. And it, it suddenly became obvious that this was, um, this was a payroll for an army that lost a battle. And the paymaster um, was killed, and he had buried the pay. And some farmer found it, probably in a pot somewhere in his field, and took it to an antique dealer who bought it for, you know, you know, uh, full loose on the dinar, I mean, for not much money. And, uh, and now it was getting into, into the trade. And every collector was going to be told, this is one of the rarest coins in the world, because coins by this ruler are virtually unknown, because nobody would know that there was now a great mass of these dinars out there. Um, so numismatics becomes a very important historical source for, uh, for Western historians, and does not become that in East Asia, because they, they cast the coins. They make a mold. They put molten copper in the mold. Um, when the mold is open, the coins are uh, you know, come out, and they're, they're coppers. So typically, you take maybe 100 or 1,000 copper coins, uh, put them in a, in a bag, and tie up the bag, and then seal the, the tie, so that you're actually paying things in purses rather than in individual coins, because the value of the coin is low. You think, well, what difference does that make? Well, one of the, thing, one of the differences is that your money weighs a lot. You know, to pay someone half a million dollars in pennies, um, you know, more than one briefcase is needed for this. You can't do it in your standard action movie. Um, so what happened uh, in the period of the Tang Dynasty uh, and uh, earlier, uh, but continuing into the Tang, um, was that officials in northern China uh, were paid in silk silk, so that lengths of silk uh, would be part of their pay because silk was fungible. Silk was a valuable item. It, was, uh, it came in fixed uh, lengths and qualities, and it was comparatively light. It was high value, and it could be transported on the, uh, on the Silk Road to buy goods from Central Asia and from the Middle East and Mediterranean world. So one of the results is, one of the, and, and it's very clear in the naming of the Silk Road that goes back hundreds of years, was that silk was not s simply a consumption uh, commodity on the Silk Road, but it was actually a means of, of exchange. And so when you read um, uh, stories of, say, uh, Buddhist monasteries in Central Asia, the quantities of silk that they have are just staggering because they'll be given as, um, as gifts by, uh, by the faithful, things like that. Um, but the, the history of, uh, of 
uh, coinage in, in East Asia becomes very complex over time because if you tie up huge amounts of copper in your money, then you have less copper available to make implements. Um, uh, then there, you know, what happens after the New World arises and you have silver from the New World showing up in China in, this, in the so-called Manila galleons that cross the Pacific Ocean. So th there's a very elaborate story of metal uh, in East Asia uh, between China and Japan and Korea and the Philippines and traders coming in from, uh, from overseas. But the types of, of things that you learn from coinage in the West uh, don't show up in the same way. It's, it's, uh, it's, a different, uh, it's a different set of skills that you bring to that sort of study. Uh, a, a parallel example um, is printing. The, in the Tang and even more in the Sung uh, era, printing through wood blocks becomes highly developed uh, in China. Uh, the way it is done is that you have a, an author who, with a brush and ink, um, you know, writes a page. And then that page uh, of writing is glued upside down on a piece of wood. Then you have a woodcutter who cuts around every inked area and cuts out the area uh, between the inked areas. So that, so the inked areas are, uh, the, the, the written areas are elevated and the others are not. Then the, the paper is removed and replaced by ink and then that is your wood block that you print with. Uh, Woodblock printing becomes um, widespread and it includes books that are devoted to uh, practical arts. We have treatises on agriculture that are highly detailed, on manufacturing, um, matter of fact, on, on, on a huge array of subjects. And these books are uh, become the common possessions of uh, you know, landholders and merchants and so on. So you have a printing culture uh, that is also a, a book culture. And it makes a great, uh, a great deal of sense that that is how things would be. The Koreans develop it into a, uh, into a movable type system and devise a separate alphabet for, for their own language. But basically, it's, it's something that arises in China and Korea roughly the same time. And at roughly the same time, it appears in, uh, in Egypt and in Iran. In Egypt and Iran, uh, the um, you have a print phenomenon, but you have no books. It is, um, it's a somewhat curious phenomenon, and one that was so little known that, um, uh, oh, say, prior to the 1980s, there were, I, there were like three publications that mentioned that they had once had printing in the Middle East, and none of those publications was read by, uh, by anybody. Uh, one was the, um, for the earliest one was a late 19th century catalog of a papyrus exhibit in, in Vienna uh, written in German. Nobody read that. But it actually had pictures of of printed material from, uh, from Egypt, from medieval Egypt. And then uh, there were one or two more mentions of it. And, uh, 
Uh, this is one of you know, the blow your own horn moments of the course, of which of course we've had many. Um, uh, I, I asked our papyrologist here at Columbia if he would sort of show me the, pap the papyrus collection over in, in uh, Butler Library in the rare book room. So we went over there together and because we had, we have a lot of papyri and there are about 150 specimens of uh, papyrus in Arabic from the early Islamic period, not a syllable of which I could read. You know, papyrus uh, handwriting in Arabic is a very, very specialized uh, skill to decipher it. And after we looked at a whole bunch of these uh, dismayingly difficult texts, mostly fragments, uh, we got to, I think it was a cigar box, and sort of emptied it out on the table and looked at bits and pieces of papyrus that had not been mounted on glass. And one of them was not papyrus, it was a, uh, an amulet printed on paper. And I looked at it and I thought, my God, that is a specimen of medieval uh, Arabic printing, which, I'd, which up to that point, there is only one specimen known of these published in the United States. And, um, and then shortly thereafter, I was able to identify um, uh, a text from the uh, uh, 10th century that actually described the context in which these prints came into being. They were, um, they were forgeries, uh, according to this text. That is to say, you would have a person who was selling to ignorant people an amulet or a talisman written by a saintly individual. You, you know, go to the peasant and you say, oh, you roll this up, put it in an amulet case around your neck, and you'll be protected from, from demons. It is written by Sheikh, you know, you know Fulan, Usak Le, whatever it is. And of course, it wasn't written at all. It was just printed. It, you know, I was turning out um, bunches of am amulets and selling them as if they were handwriting. Uh, they didn't look like handwriting, but nobody knew that you could have any writing that wasn't handwriting. Uh, and the source specifically said, these are sold to illiterates um, because a literate person would be suspicious. The hand but it was an amazing text because it had the characters were about a millimeter high, and there were 111 lines of text, of which I was able to read about the first 50 by finding Quranic passages that were there. And the style was that of numismatic um, Kufic, which is a very, very particular style of writing in Arabic. And it also became apparent that, um, that these prints were not made exclusively, once I found other examples, were not made exclusively on wood, but were cast metal. And so the process appears to have been uh, something from Mesopotamia probably, where people would uh, take a, um, a tablet of clay. Of course, they'd had tablets of clay for you know, thousands of years, and they would you know, write, a met, write something in the clay. Then they would build up borders around the text and pour molten tin over the whole thing. Then when the tin cooled, they'd take the tin plate off and use that to print from because the plate would have reversed the letters. Then when they printed, it becomes, uh, it becomes uh, uh, correct again. And, um, and I found a poetic reference to to metal plates of, of this sort. And so then there was the, the question of the earliest prints in the Muslim world are almost simultaneous with the earliest prints in China. And that, that was a puzzlement. Um, did, was this a Chinese technology that came west or is it 
uh, simultaneous invention. Um, the argument for simultaneous invention was strengthened by the fact that uh, all of the known prints, which now we have in excess of 100 uh, worldwide, and, you know, after I published on this, um, museum curators started to open their amulet cases. Because who cared what was in the amulet case? It was the nice amulet case that was on exhibit. But they opened it and they started pulling out printed, you know, medieval prints. Uh, and then they found them in actual excavations in Cairo. So, you know, there's no question about it. But um, uh, the common feature is that all of the prints are on paper. Uh, but paper was invented in China. And we have uh, chronicles that tell us that in, uh, you know, in the six, what, 750s, there is a battle in Central Asia between the Chinese and the Arabs, and that uh, prisoners taken in that battle, um, in, when it were Chinese prisoners were taken to Samarkand where they taught the Arabs how to make paper. So we have a plausible um, you know, ballpark period for the beginning of paper, and then the printing comes after that. Although actually the paper techniques were rather different. Paper techniques in China had to do with chopping up uh, leaves, uh, whereas in the West, uh, in the Middle East, it came chopping up uh, cloth. Um, so the paper probably comes from China. There's an excellent book by Jonathan Bloom called Paper Before Print. But the printing appears, and it has no impact. Um, one print that has been found is a page from a Quran. Only one page. I've never seen the original. I don't know whether it's printed on both sides or not. I think it's only on one side. But it suggests that somebody actually printed a Quran in Arabic sometime in the, um, like, 400 years before Gutenberg uh, printed the Bible. And it had no, no impact. By the year 1400, all of the prints have disappeared. There is no surviving memory of there ever having been printing. And printing is reintroduced into the Muslim world um, very slowly uh, in the 17th, from the 17th century onward. Uh, and mostly in the 19th century. And it's a story that, that gives rise to questions of if you have a new technology, um, is there something ineluctable about a technology that will lead to its being, uh, to its having an impact, to its being used? Uh, or are there, um, are there barriers uh, that will cause people to know of a technology but not to use it? Or to have a technology and not recognize uh, its purpose, um, or its possible uh, purpose. The, the history of technological uh, developments in East Asia that come to have uh, extensions in the West, uh, either in the Muslim world or in Europe, is a very uh, well-studied history, usually focusing on, um, on gunpowder and, uh, uh, and the compass. Uh, developments in the West having an influence on China are talked about less often, and yet they are of some importance, particularly in the area of, of astronomy. The central government of China, which, as I say, was um, you know, the government of China for, um, you know, for most of 2,000 years, uh, always had an astronomy department. 
a central uh, agency that dealt with, with astronomy and with the calendar. Uh, it's, it sometimes functioned with all the efficiency, say, of the U.S. Postal Service. It's not known to be the most imaginative department, but, but the whole notion that you would have a government with an astronomy department for 2,000 years is somewhat, um, uh, somewhat hard to, to, to grasp, unless, of course, you're a specialist on hukou voodoo, because <laughs> that will explain it all. It's a... Uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of comparisons that leave you puzzled as to uh, not so much the points of contact, which people have written so much about, but at the persistence of points of difference. Um, the, let me just take an obvious one. Uh, chopsticks. Um, you have Westerners who go to China starting in the Mongol period, occasionally starting even before, and you can be sure that they all got there and found people eating with chopsticks. And they all, you know, tried to eat with chopsticks. And they came back and they talked about the marvels of China and nobody brought any chopsticks back. Um, chopsticks are great for eating, um, but nobody reports that they ate with chopsticks. And, and you sort of wonder why. And of course, the, from a Chinese point of view, they say, well, metal has a nasty taste, so we shouldn't eat with metal. Of course, you could say the Europeans were eating with their fingers and, um, and licking their fingers afterwards, and so they liked the taste. but. Uh, you sort of wonder why some things move and some things don't. Now, uh, next week, when we get to talking about uh, pre-Columbian America, one of the things that will eventually arise is what's called the, the Columbian Exchange. That is to say, the exchange of, of um, products and um, technologies and so on across the Atlantic between Europe and the Americas. Uh, the story of exchange, and, and there it'll, it'll seem sort of straightforward. You know, we get turkeys, they get sheep, that sort of thing. Um, but the story of exchange uh, between East Asia and the Afro-Eurasian uh, ecumene uh, is, is a much more mysterious one. There is a classic work by a scholar named Bertolt Laufer called Sino-Ironica. Laufer was a, um, worked for the, uh, I believe for the Field Museum in Chicago, Natural History Museum. And what it is, is a list of all things known to have moved one way or another across the Silk Road. And it gives the Chinese names, it gives the, uh, the Latin names, and you see those things that move. And you look at the list and you think, okay, what things didn't move? You know, why were uh, some things not, not included? Or if something that didn't move, or that did move, uh, has negligible effect? So, you know, Maybe somebody brought chopsticks from China and said, you know, my lord, chopsticks. You can eat your, you know, your, your roast duck with the chopsticks. He tries to stab the duck or something. Uh, you, you, you don't know. We don't know the, the details. But you, we know, for example, that wine grapes and the making of wine moves across the Silk Road from the west to China, and nobody cares very much. Wine does not become a big deal. This doesn't mean that Chinese don't drink. Uh, you know, go to a Chinese banquet sometime and see the variety of things that you're offered, but, uh, but wine wasn't 
as interesting, say, as rice wine, or to say grape wine. So, um, as uh, just thinking ahead on a sort of personal basis, sometime in the beginning of January, um, if current plan holds, the remaining authors of the Earth and its peoples will get together in Boston and we'll decide what do we want to see in a sixth edition. And one of the issues will be, do we need to hire an East Asian historian to do competently what Professor Bullitt is doing in a, an amateurish fashion? Uh, and if so, do we bring in someone who will accept the structure of things as we have it, as, that we've, as, we've, as we have had it for five comparatively successful editions, or, will we, or we, will we invite in an author and say, start over on East Asia, do it your way. We want your view um, to be our new structure. And if so, does that open up the whole question of the structure of the book? Do we? Will we even uh, broach the topic of doing a fundamental rethinking of how this book approaches world history? And I think that um, how that discussion proceeds, uh, and then whether we can sell the results to the publishing company, um, uh, may, may turn out to be uh, very interesting. But uh, I can't imagine what a new author would feel like coming into an existing project as an East Asianist and saying, you know, you can start over and do it your way, except it has to fit with all the other chapters. Uh, because we're not going to read our, rewrite our chapters just for you. And um, so it'll, 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 it'll be a puzzle. But it's, it's built into the whole problem of um, of world history becoming sort of ossified prematurely. That you get a certain way of doing it, it seems to work, other people imitate you or you imitate other people, publishers converge, books become more and more alike. And will the, will the point come where we can do a start over? And if you're going to do a start over, uh, clearly uh, you need uh, new people to suggest how to do it, and also uh, younger people. As someone who turned 70 last week, I'm very conscious of not being the youngest uh, person uh, you know, on the planet. And um, so um, this will, whether this is the last time I teach this course or not, I teach it again in a few years, who knows? I may be teaching a very different book. So I'll stop here and we'll go to the new world um, next time.